declares the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring light. Oh, Jesus, yours is the victory, yeah, oh, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, yes, salvation. Well, good morning to you, Battleground. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and happy Easter. I cannot believe it's already April, and we're in the middle of the a new year, and we have the opportunity today to celebrate that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. Listen, as we continue to sing, I just wanted to give you this little simple encouragement. So because Jesus is alive, we have a living hope. And what I mean by that is not just that we have an eternal hope. That's one thing. We have an incredible inheritance awaiting for us one day when Jesus comes back to raise us from the dead physically to live with him forever. Yes, that is an eternal hope. We also have a living hope, meaning that right here and now, because Jesus Christ is risen and because he is living inside of us, that means that we have this hope that there's no fear, there's no worries about the day or tomorrow because he is living. He's with us here and now. That's incredible news. The song we're about to sing just here in a second is Because He Lives. I know you know it. This is what the chorus says. This is Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Because He Lives, All Fear Is Gone. Because I Know He Holds My Future. This life is worth the living because he lives. Let's continue to sing about this hope this morning. Let's continue to praise our Savior who is alive forevermore. Let's sing. God sent his son. They called him.
Well, again, good morning and happy Easter. And as the church has said for many years, He is risen. He is risen indeed. And, and so we wanted to welcome you, invite you to open up a copy of God's Word on this, on this Easter morning to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 3 to 5 this morning. And uh, we, we have normally uh, been working through the Gospel of James. And so we stopped last week. And last week we, we started a two-week series that we're going to finish up on Easter th this morning. Uh, we looked at 1 Corinthians 15 last week about the historical Jesus. And now this week we're going to try to move from fear to hope. We are worshiping inside this morning. We're actually worshiping outside it on Easter. And so we brought you inside a little earlier just to try to remove the distractions. And so we hope that you will open with me. And now let's read God's Word together. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Lord, as we hear from your word and as we celebrate today the resurrection of your Son, who is our only hope to have fear to have fear removed and to have hope in this life and in the next. Lord, we come to you today worshiping you and asking to hear from your word. Uh, settle us, we pray, as there is much in many of our lives to be fearful of and anxious over and even hopeless this morning. And so bring us to the living hope today through the power of your word for the glory of your name. Amen. So as I said, last week we looked at the historical Jesus, and we did that to see that the foundation of our hope, your hope must have to have a foundation, just like your house has a foundation, that our foundation is the fact that of the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and now, and we want to ask this question, and I think if you're honest, as long as I'm being honest with myself and you, I think we can have this start in place that sometimes I understand that, that Jesus is my living hope, that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, but I still battle hopelessness. So how do I move? How do you move from fear to hope? That's our main idea today is this, the resurrected Jesus removes our hopelessness by bringing us into a living hope. So I want to I want to see us to see two things this morning, the reality of loss and the blessing of a living hope. The reality of a loss of hope. That's the context of 1 Peter. Matter of fact, if you've been listening to us going through James, you'll know that that's the context of James. Uh, it's, the Bible is real. Much of these letters were written to people who were suffering, and so it was that that Peter was writing to people that would have been scattered everywhere to where it would be today, modern Turkey, northern Turkey. That's where this letter was written to. Suffering is a major theme. It's mentioned 16 times. As a matter of fact, Peter uses eight different Greek words to describe suffering in this letter. So think about it. <laughs> All you got to do is think back a couple of years. It's easy. What things have happened in your life and in my life and in this country and in other countries around us that could cause us to lose hope? That's the reality. It was their reality. It's yours. I mean, just think about it. The war going on right now. We've had sickness. We've had death. How many people, how many funerals have you been to in the last two years? And if we can think about James for a minute, back to the book of James. James, remember, has already told us, Count these trials joy. <laughs> so how in the world do you count COVID joy? How do you count the war in the Ukraine joy? How do you count the loss of a loved one joy? I mean, is James really serious? Yes, he is. But here's the truth today. Not only have we not counted them joy, they have oriented us or pointed us towards hopelessness. Not only is this our reality, our culture is not helping us at all, is it? 
We have the polarization of our community going on. And I, I know I'm 50. I, I've never seen a community so polarized from each other. The media that we consume is feeding our fears. There's a, there's a worldview called postmodernism that promotes tribalism. This tribalism divides us up into groups. It says the only thing that matters in life is your group, your gender group, or your ethnic group, and nobody else matters. Just find a group of them and fight for your rights. It, it means that if my melanin content is different than yours, then we can't even get along. We have no unity that we're supposed to be divided. And we see this happening. And all this does is breed a distrust which leads to hopelessness. Even in our communities around here, there seems to be a loss of even that we can work together for any kind of common good. And so... Hope is all, hopelessness is all around us. Listen to Timothy Keller. He said, The greatest threat to our hope for a better world is not the natural environment, but the various evils that continually spring up from the human heart. Uh, Peter's point here is the only hope that really can bring us any lasting hope is if there is a living God who cares. That's the power of the resurrection. Listen again to verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's an exclamation point there. This is a celebration. Because according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what I want us to spend most of our time on today is to simply look at our need, the blessing of a living hope. But let's make sure we get our words right, our definition right. What is hope? Hope is full assurance. Hope is not an uncertain, wishful thinking desire. It is uh, unshakable confidence. Biblical hope is an unshakable confidence that what God said He's going to do, He's actually going to do it. That's hope. That's what the resurrection gives us, a living hope, an unshakable confidence. So how do we use that? How do we fight for that to actually have hope in our actual life that we're living today and that you're going to go out and live tomorrow? When we feel hopeless, we need to remind ourselves of a few things in these verses this morning. First is our present blessing. (laughs) There's a lot we could talk about. If you're sitting on a couch with your friends or at, a, or at a table or that you will have maybe a nice lunch or dinner later with family, you, you are reminded of your blessings. But that blessing here is a specific blessing. We see it in verse 3, that the blessing centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. This blessing is God's mercy. Do you see it? It is His great mercy. That's the cause of the blessing. Our blessing is in relation to God's mercy. That's what he's saying. Do you see it? He has caused this. Listen to what he says a little bit later in chapter 2, verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It reminds me of that wonderful little prophet called Hosea. We're, this, we were no mercy, and now we have been given mercy. We have mercy, not because we deserve it. Mercy is not mercy if you deserved it. Grace is not grace if you earned it. It is mercy because we actually deserve justice, and instead we got mercy. It's not anything if Jesus is not alive, but because it is, it is ours. Notice this, this blessing comes through a means. And the means is the resurrection. Do you see it? He has, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our blessing comes through a means. And the means is a living hope because it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We looked at this last week. And if you, if you want to go back and listen to that sermon, it would be a great connection to this week. 1 Corinthians 15, he said, If Jesus is not alive, there's no hope. There's no life. 
There's, not, there's no point to this life and there's no hope in the, in, in the life to come. Uh, the language here in verse 3 is a present, active, ongoing hope. He gives us a present, active, ongoing life. So when we feel hopeless, we need to remind ourselves of our blessings and look at the end of verse 3, our sovereign birth. He has caused us to be born again. That's a very clear language. It simply means to beget again, to be born again. This is the language that Jesus introduced in John 3. Do you remember? Nicodemus couldn't wrap his head around it. What did it mean to be born again? We talked last week about the danger of this liberal Jesus. This Jesus that many churches preach, that Jesus is just this glorified example, and that you just need to try harder to be like Jesus. That's not what it means to be born again. The new birth is not try harder theology. It's not stopping bad habits and starting good habits. It's not adopting a new set of morals. And listen, I'm going to read this. I want you to listen to me very clearly. The new birth is a supernatural, effective, and mysterious work of the Holy Spirit that occurs beneath and prior to all necessary, positive human responses to the gospel. I don't know how to be any more clearer than that because I want to give you a hope that's living this morning. The new birth is supernatural. It is effective. It is mysterious. It is from the Holy Spirit that occurs beneath and prior to anything necessary that we do to respond to the gospel. He brings us alive when we were dead. You were born again of a reason outside of yourself. He has caused it. That's what the verse is saying. Do you see it? He has caused it. So he gets the glory. Listen to Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, The fact that Jesus Christ died is more important than the fact that I will die. And the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead is the sole ground of my hope that I too will be raised on the day of judgment. Our salvation is from outside ourselves. I find salvation not in my life story, but only in the story of Jesus Christ. That's why we're gathered today as the church to celebrate. Every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection, but especially on Easter. 1 Peter 1.23 says that this new birth comes by means as well. Chapter 1 and verse 23, it says it's by the imperishable Word of God. In other words, the Word is planted, the Spirit brings life. We plant the gospel. The Spirit saves, not us. <laughs> so when you feel hopeless, you need to remind yourself of this. I didn't save myself, and so I am safe in my Father's arms. You didn't crawl and scratch up your Father's legs to climb up in His lap. You are dead on the ground, and He grabbed you and quickened you to life and set you in His arms. You're safe. And we need to be reminded of that when we feel hopeless. When we feel hopeless, we remind ourselves of the blessing of our sovereign birth, but also our future inheritance. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. So He brings us into new life, but He also gives us something else new, a new inheritance. Now, don't go mystical because Peter is very clear in 2 Peter that our inheritance is connected inseparably to a new heaven and a new earth. This blows my mind. It is beyond my ability to explain that the new heaven and the new earth is a bringing together of that which is spiritual and that which is physical into a whole new reality. But our inheritance is rooted in our future home. He gives us these descriptive words. Do you see them? Look again at verse 4. He says your inheritance is imperishable. It is undefiled. It is unfading. In other words, it can't perish. It doesn't spoil and it won't fade. Everything that you have on this life wears out, including your body, including mine. 
I, I, I bet you have done this sometimes, especially at Christmas. This is when I do it. There's certain things that our family makes that we only make once a year. Uh, maybe it's those Oreo balls. You know what I'm talking about? That white, good stuff, probably just all sugar that they put over it, or peanut butter balls, or the whatever it is. Just put it in your mind for a minute. And I bet you've done this to where you only had a few of them and you knew you wasn't going to get them again for a year, so you tried to make it last. Maybe you cut it in half and probably hid it from your children and. And then you pulled it out one day in that secret drawer where you keep it when nobody knew where it was. And what was there? Mold. <laughs> this precious dessert that you tried to keep for yourself has simply went bad. He's describing this. One, one guy puts it this way. Our inheritance is death-proof, sin-proof, and time-proof. And so in times of hopelessness, we remind ourselves of our blessing of our sovereign birth and our future inheritance. But look, he's not done. He says when we feel hopeless, you need to remind yourself of something else, our eternal security. Let me read it again. It says, We are saved to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. I want you to see two words there, kept and guarded. You see in verse 4, kept. The words are really close to the same. That word kept means to guard or to reserve. This means something. Think about this with me. In order for Him to reserve your inheritance, it must already exist. Your inheritance already exists, brothers and sisters. And He's guarding it. He's reserved it. If I took my iPad right now that I'm using and I said, I'm giving this iPad to you and it's here and after, the, after I'm service, I want you to come and get it. That means that I'll have reserved this for you. It's yours and I'm going to guard it. Somebody else is not going to be able to come and get it because it is yours. And it's being guarded by God. But not only is our inheritance guarded, but you are. You are. Your salvation is. Notice it turns in verse 5 into a who. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith. This is not just about Him guarding our inheritance's future. He's guarding us now. This means to shield, to watch over. Got that shepherding language, isn't it? And this language is very clear. This is a present tense continual guarding continual shielding. He is protecting it right now. He's not saying that He's going to shield us from pain and suffering. You know as well as me that's not true. He's going through us. Psalms 23, He walks through those things with us. He is watching. He is guarding us. He is guarding our salvation. He is guarding our inheritance. But notice the tension here. Look at the text. He's doing it through faith. Through faith. Faith is a continual trusting, a faithfulness. The Bible doesn't have a point of reference to conceive faith as some single isolated act. A genuine faith is a living faith in all of life. It continues in your life until the day either you go to be with Him or He comes to get us. There's a tension here that we can't, we can't separate God's protection from our trusting. The same God's power, look at the text, the same power that guards our salvation, guards us, and it guards our inheritance, also empowers the faith for us to continually trust and believe. And both are necessary. And both are present in the Christian life. And we must remind ourselves that even our faith, though sometimes very small, should give us hope. When we feel hopeless, Finally, look at the end of verse 5. We need to remind ourselves of our awaiting home. This is very much connected to our inheritance. Our salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. This is, notice the issue here is salvation. You see that? There again, the Bible doesn't have a place for salvation is merely a past experience. 
It does have a beginning. It is that new birth that we talked about earlier. That's when it began, but it continues through our life in the transformation we call sanctification to be like Christ. That's your salvation. And not only that, it's waiting to be revealed in the last time when we will be in the presence of God and no longer be in the presence of sin. Last week we said that's the point of the resurrection because He's accomplished all of this. He started it. He's going to complete it. All of this He's calling us to remember this morning. I know you know this passage, but it's always good to read it on these special days. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. Paul concludes this amazing resurrection chapter this way. He says, I tell you this, brothers... Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the, Im- when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass that it is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor... It's not in vain. So what today? Well, really, you've got to study the rest of 1 Peter to get to so what. And, and, hey, it's, it's Easter and I'm about done. But I want to point out three things that, for, that Peter goes on to explain to us about since this is true. He says you need to remember these things. But then I want you to live with hope. And, and listen, brothers and sisters, this is the hard part. The actual living with hope. But this is what Paul, Peter's concerned with. This is what we must be concerned with. And I thought about how to word this, and I hope this, this makes sense to you. It's possible for you and for me to have positional hope, but not conditional hope. It is possible for us, do you know what I mean by that? Think about that with me. For us to understand and know what Jesus Christ did for me. And to know that and to believe it. And still my present condition is still battling constantly with hopelessness, with fear and anxiety. How can I know these things and, and, and still be hopeless? It's positionally I understand it. But conditionally, I don't always feel it. Is that true in your life? I think it's true in most of our lives if we were honest with each other. What can I do? What should I do? Well, Peter goes on to explain, and I just want to give them to you. Study the book for yourself. Check me out on this. The main three points that Peter goes on to explain in his letter is the first off, how do we live with a, a living hope out in our life is to be holy. We must be like Christ. We must put our lives, that's how we express our living hope. That's how a living hope comes when we make a choice that my life is going to put Christ on display. Through the suffering. He's already declared these things. Think about it. He has already given us His salvation, His name, His authority, His spirit, His forgiveness, His inheritance, His security. All of this He has already given to us. They are provided. They are reserved. They are ours. He's saying, now go display that in your life. How would these things are really ours? What would our life look like if we put them on display? He's already said, you are my child. So go live like my child. Put me on display. This will give you hope, brothers and sisters, when you realize that your purpose is greater than your pain or your past. Simply display Jesus, scars and all. He will make Himself look good in our life. Brothers and sisters, He's telling us today that we are His holy instruments. Or as Paul Tripp says, we are redeemers. 
We were instruments in the Redeemer's hands. That means, secondly, that we should be a witness. <laughs> you've heard this if you've listened to me much. It's all you got today. It doesn't matter whether you're homeless or whether you're a billionaire. At the end of the day, you've got two things to give people, the gospel and your life. And no matter how little you have this morning, you have those two things. He's saying if you want to, if you want to have hope today, if you're battling hope, if you want hope to be a reality in your life, then join God on His mission. I can promise you that'll bring you hope. Here's what He's saying. I don't know how to say it, but just to be truthful with you, that means you need to get off the couch and join us at the rescue mission to help people. People who want help. you got to get up and do something if you want to have hope. You can't just sit there and expect it to come. Jesus Christ has given you everything. And He says, I want you to live like me. I want you to reflect me. And I want you to get out there and tell the world who I am and what I've done. You need to join Him. Maybe that means mentoring a child in the public schools. Maybe it means you coach a ball team. But what it means, if it means nothing else, is that your responsibility, if you want to have hope, Help one person know what it means to follow Jesus. You want to have hope? You're battling hopelessness. Then do this one thing. Be holy and be a witness. They are really one thing. Two great joys of my life. You know me, you know this. It's preaching and meeting people one-on-one. -on -one. There is simply no greater hope than to have someone help you follow Jesus and then you in turn help somebody else. This is the work that's before us. There's a third thing that Peter wants us to get. That is to be loving. To be like Christ, to be holy, to be on mission, and to be loving. And I want to apply this as we close in a very simple, direct way, a very distinct way. The greatest secret to having this conditional, this practical hope is what Christ has already bought for you, and that is your local church. This is the place. It is His gift to you. She is not perfect, but she is the place where God knits people together that have the same gospel, the same mission, and the same love. Where are you going to find that? Where are you going to find those three things? Only in the local church, because He only gave it to her. You see, that it is in the church that together we begin to learn things. As we gather together every week, we learn about how to show mercy as we have received mercy. How to be compassionate as our Lord is compassionate. How to forgive as we are forgiven. We learn that we don't have to be like each other to love each other. That we are brought together in Christ precisely because we are not all the same, but we are all redeemed. This, the church is the place where it's okay for you not to be okay. It's a place to where we all struggle for holiness together. That we all learn how to join in God's mission together. It's a place to where we just love each other even when we don't deserve it and even when we don't feel like it. You can't experience a living hope if you're not connected to His church. This is critical. The greatest barrier in your life to experience a living hope is isolation. And the greatest instrument towards experiencing a living hope that Jesus lived for, died for, and rose again for is the church of Jesus Christ. It's as practical as it gets this morning, brothers and sisters. Listen to what Paul said, Colossians 3.12, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved and compassionate hearts, Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And so, this morning, let us remember our resurrected living hope is not an idea, it's not a philosophy, it is a person, his name is Jesus. And He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. And so, Lord, we thank You 
that as our Father, you have given us a hope that is not just a belief system. It is not a, a set of habits or principles or rules. Or, it is a person that we follow. It is a person that we love because he's first loved us. And so, Lord, we celebrate today through our gathering, through our giving. Lord, even in a few minutes, as, as we will go to either on our phones or on the computer and we will give our offering not only to the church, but also uh, for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Lord, we do that because we are all gathered together under the same mission. And so, Lord, we thank you for these opportunities you have given us. Lord, bring your people not simply to a hope that they understand in their head, but a hope that they experience in their life, even in the midst of the suffering. We love you and we trust you, and we thank you that you have given us Jesus, and he is enough. In his name we pray. Amen. The Father's brand Darkness claims that he's defeated. Don't break the third day. Oh, hallelujah, it is finished. Oh, hallelujah, Christ is won. Oh, hallelujah, hell's defeated. Hallelujah. Thank you for worshiping with us again. Uh, happy Easter to you. I hope you enjoy your, your families and, and the rest of your day. As Before, you, before you, you, you check out, let me encourage you that if you haven't given, you can do that safely online. Today is a special day for us. We are ce celebrating Annie Armstrong Easter offering as Southern Baptists. That means that 100% of everything you give to that offering goes to our missionaries in North America. 
And so as, as Southern Baptists, we love these Easter and Christmas when we can give so directly. You can do that safely on our website. So if you go to our website, you can give safely to not only Annie Armstrong Easter offering, but if you would like to give um, through the regular offering, you can do all that safely right there. Uh, more importantly, we love you and the Lord loves you. And now go and practice that which you have received.